Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Orko, and I am the theme lead of Magic of AI topic in today's Pan IIT conference, uh, Pivot 2021. Welcome, everyone. Um, we have with us a very special guest today as the keynote speaker of Magic of AI topic. Uh, Mr. Sashi Narendi is the founder and CEO of High Radius. Uh, let me give a quick bio of Sashi and uh, then Sashi can take over. So Sashi co-founded High Radius and brings a unique combination of business management expertise and technical knowledge to his leadership of the High Radius team and corporate strategy. This focus on business process improvement is the driving philosophy behind High Radius's offerings and results in our customers being achieving peak financial performance through improvements such as reduced ESA and outstanding, great operational efficiency and increased reduction equity. He has worked with many Fortune 1000 companies in, in implementing credit management, collections management, dispute <coughs> management, and invoicing and payment solution. Prior to High Radius, Sashi uh, served as the CEO of Rivers and Technologies, a provider of master data management solutions. Sashi holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering from University of Maryland College Park and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from IIT Madras. Welcome, Sashi. All right. Thank you for having me, Arka. Let me share my screen. Uh, I guess I have 30 minutes. Uh, I'm going to actually follow a format that we follow at High Radius. We call it Setup in 18. Uh, most of us leaders in the leadership team at High Radius use this limit. We are inspired by TED to keep the presentation less than 10 minutes, 18 minutes. But since we have 30 minutes, I, I'm also happy to take any questions towards the end. So feel free to submit your questions in the chat box along the way. And then we'll have another 10 to 12 minutes towards the end. So I've actually never presented to an IIT group. So this is the first for me. As soon as uh, Arka and team pinged me a week back, I was like, what do I present? Topic is magic of AI. And I'm on this WhatsApp group with my Godavari hostel friends and the, and the batchmates and so forth. So I was like, I'll, I just happened to see this image that I want to share. and then. If you see here, that is me in pink stripes, and then all my buddies from IIT. And then I was like, wow, what a geek group. So I'm going to make my presentation uh, intertwine AI with the IITians, which I think are geeky in a positive way. Um, <clears throat> one call out, though, if you can see here, you see my hand. Um, I'm not asking for the sutra to be passed along. I'm just doing a victory sign. So with that, I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to do a quick two minute high readers intro because the presentation is about magic of AI. So you know what, who we are and what we do. So big picture, high readers is a software company for the office of the CFO, uh, mostly focused on enterprises. Uh, the office of the CFO comprises of six functional categories. We focus on two of them. One of them is called order to cash. We have six products, uh, five products actually in this case, and treasury is two products. And just some high level background about High Radius, uh, about 2,900 employees. 85% uh, of our workforce is in India, so we are pretty heavily focused based out of India. Uh, about 700 plus customers. We process about 2 trillion transactions annually through our platform. And then we've been very lucky over the last five years, we've had a 60% plus uh, annual growth rate. Uh, we bootstrap the business for almost 11 years before we decided to do our first round of funding. So a little bit of a different journey. But then we did like three rounds of funding ABC over the last three, four years. Um, and then the, the thesis there was we're trying to build a long-term business. So I didn't want to raise money too early and so forth. Um, and then that's the background about High Radius. This is a portfolio for clients. We are mostly focused on the Western markets in the US, Europe. The bigger the company logo, the better for High Radius because we make a working capital impact. It's easier to build a business case and deliver results uh, if they have high receivables because receivables is 40% of a company's uh, balance sheet. So that's the background about High Radius. I'm going to switch gears because this presentation is more about you. And um, picking up on the nerd theme, uh, there is a perfect, perfect storm of opportunity brewing for you. And I want to talk about that. Uh, I know that the topic is magic of AI. Um, I'm not going to talk about hundreds of thousands of use cases. I'm going to talk about the perfect storm, which is the geek's time to peak. 
and then how you can make an impact to brand India and put, put India on the world map. So let me take a step back and talk about the world leading brands in India. So here's a chart. This is a, uh, every year there is a brand agency that publishes the top leading brands of the world. Uh, I'm sure you recognize many of them. Um, and we probably consume many of these brands as well. But this chart has a problem. This chart doesn't have a single brand that is made in India. So the question is, where is India? It's not about why and the past to present. So I'm going to focus this on the potential opportunity of the present to future. So let's double click on that. So that is the perfect storm that is brewing and all the IATMs on this call can potentially make an impact. So I believe that every company will be a tech company in a decade from now. Why? If you just research the top 500 public companies in the US, the map has completely shifted. Just five companies make up 20% of the market cap of the 500 companies. Those are the Famga, famous in the Famga. I'm sure all of you know the logos. And then other 68 companies make up another 20%. So literally the tech companies now make up 40% of the market cap of the top 500 companies. And the non-tech is 60%. If you go back a decade, this map would have been completely different. So literally tech is already engulfing into uh, and how it's transforming the world. Now, why is that the case? One of the key reasons for that is the explosion of data. In the last two years, we have generated 90% of the data in the world. Literally what that means is from the beginning of time, the last two years we have generated as much data as much less before that. And that I think is providing a huge opportunity on how you can potentially disrupt leveraging the data sphere that's been created. And that is creating a ton of pressure on the non-tech companies. So I actually personally work with a lot of CFOs, finance leaders, uh, and then I constantly hear the, our customers and the stakeholders are feeling the pressure from their CEOs and the board, and they're very insecure about what is going to happen to us. Will we be disrupted? Because they're seeing this in so many other categories that it's happening. I'm going to quote some examples, the famous ones that you all know, the retail sector and what Amazon has done, the experience of being able to buy something in literally five minutes. If you go back in time, I'm sure we were driving around over the weekend from store to store and doing the comparison shopping, but the power of data that Amazon has aggregated, it is the largest database of shoppers data, and using that to deliver an experience for an end user like us to make a decision in five minutes. That's amazing. We're seeing this in the automobile industry. If you think about Tesla car, the core physical aspects of the car is more or less the same. I'm sure there is some fancy stuff out there, but the core is still the same but it is the autonomous driving capability, which is again, a tech play. That is a highly differentiated play. We know what happened to Blockbuster. Netflix is probably one of the largest content aggregators, but it also delivers a very unique experience using AI and how you consume it. Hospitality industry like Marriott and Hilton are completely being disrupted by companies like Airbnb. You can literally make a decision in 10 minutes and globally visit any country, any place just through a mobile app. But the core underlying aspect of that is the data aggregation of the vacation rentals and how do you bring that experience to end users to make a immediate decision. I'm sure none of us use the yellow tab, yellow cab or another mode of transportation. And what Uber has done in connecting the network of passengers and drivers and how you can make a decision for a ride in a few minutes. So these are some of the use cases the key here is not just about the AI. What I want to emphasize is it's the data plus AI and then how they come together to fundamentally change how industries are being served and customers are being served. And if I just take a very random example, I mean, I'm thinking about the Kirana store uh, in my gully when I was growing up, right? A very physical aspect. But imagine if, I mean, this is a potential industry for disruption by someone who is just bringing the data aspect, collecting not just the every customer visit and every interaction and the data collection aspect of this, 
But if you do it as a platform where you collect that across multiple Kirana stores, and who knows what the disruption means? I have no idea. But I think it's a potential opportunity for us to think about. Specifically about high radius, I want to share our own uh, real world example of the journey that we have gone through. So when we started the business, we are a 14 year old company. The first seven years was very hard to di differentiate. We, had, we went through a lot of hardships. A, we were bootstrapped. We used to compete with two companies. One of them is the big giant SAP and another company called Viltrus. SAP was a big brand. And how do you compete with SAP? And then of course, one of our top competitors, Viltrus had already raised about $80 million and they were flooding the market with salespeople, marketing people, and we were just not able to differentiate. So we were hurting and we were not doing as well. Fast forward now, about seven years back, we realized that we are actually accumulating data as we acquire every big company. Every time we go acquire a Nike or a Walmart, we are probably also in our platform getting 50,000 of their end customers. And how do you leverage that big data for that specific domain and then we started building this AI use cases. We also have a lot of patents. And now we are market leaders. So the last seven years was very different than before. So if you take the same company, same software category, we are completely disrupting the, the, the space. So I'm going to switch gears to what does it mean to build a global category leader from India? Of course, none of us are there, uh, but we will see. What does it mean? What, what could be the potential path? So first, I believe to build a category leader, you have to have an original idea. You need to build a new category or disrupt an existing category. We cannot do copy and paste. We don't want to be, so my recommendation is don't try to be the low cost Chinese manufacturer. That's number one. Number two is building a category lead means that you need to have a high appetite for failure tolerance. It's a long game and you need to be willing to fail a lot before you have become successful. And number three, I think is the pride is a very critical element. The pride of building something original. Because if you don't build something original, you're not a follower. If you're a follower, you're not going to be a category leader in your space. And if you have not one, then how do you build a big brand that is a, uh, a global brand? So these are the three elements we think about if you have to build a category leader. And of course, that's all theory. You're all probably wondering, I'm an IATN, probably a fresh grad out of college or uh, 20 to 25 years of experience in the workforce. Beyond theory, how can we make this actionable for you in a practical manner, literally selfishly? So I believe the first thing could be stop working for the big established brands, the Goldman Sachs, the Bank of America, and so forth. If you are maybe join an AI startup, it's a low risk gig. If you're a young talent, literally graduating, full-time role. If you're an experienced talent, maybe you could be an in an advisory role. They could literally use this. I still could use a lot of advice, but 14 years back, I, I was pretty clueless in what I was doing. So you can make an impact that way. Of course, you can go to the other extreme boundary condition of doing your own startup, then you need to be ready to bet on a 10 year journey. It's a high risk, high reward game. But then I'm sure many of you who are attendees here are saying like, I'm not from tech. What about me? What about non-tech talent? So I'm gonna take an example of a high radian. We refer to our employees as high radians. His name is Anupam Kunwar. Uh, he's a junior of ours, few years uh, junior, and he was introduced to us by, through a network. And he was actually doing a solar energy business. And then no AI background, but he actually figured the whole thing out in six months, literally made a switch. And then he's actually one of our AVPs of machine learning for one of our product lines. He literally cracked the code. And then now we actually forecast cash for our clients with a 30% improvement of accuracy versus a traditional method. So I think the takeaway here is you might be from non-tech, but you could potentially embark on this huge opportunity for you by maybe making the switch, even though if you are non-tech. I'm going to take another example of, you might be like, oh, what if I'm not in India? I already relocated. That was the case for me. So I was actually, did my undergrad in India, came to the US to do my master's, but actually relocated to India for five years and worked full time with my family there. And I learned a lot through the process of the opportunity from India. So 
I highly encourage people to consider this. I'm going to give another example. One of our own classmates, his name is Srini, and then he worked at Amazon. He was the head of ads business, and now he's going to relocate to India to be a general manager for our small and medium business market segment, which is our fastest growing business. Also, I want to talk about another concept, which is the shift of leadership that is happening from the old guard to the new guard. These are the traditional business leaders. Most of them have sales and marketing backgrounds. I'm not sure if you're, McDonald's is a big brand everybody knows. You should watch a movie called The Founder. It's very intriguing. I literally ended up watching it twice. He's a hardcore sales guy who started the company and then built a big business. Same thing with IKEA, huge brand. Is a hardcore sales guy. Nike, MBA background, hardcore sales guy. So if you think about the history of time, and if you remember, if you think about the the global brands, pretty much every leader of those global brands is a hardcore sales guy. Salesforce, Mark Benioff is the hardcore sales guy ever. He was actually the head of sales for Oracle, and he left Oracle and started a competing company. Now, what does this mean? Do you have to be a hardcore sales guy? I don't think so. That is the perfect storm of opportunity. The new generation of geek leaders are emerging. CEO of Google, Microsoft, and now IBM. These are people with very similar backgrounds as you. Not McDonald's and Nike and others. That is the geek's time to peak and how you can make an impact to put brand India on the world map. I'm going to take a step back. What does that mean? Right? Of course, we talked about the art of the possible. I remember I was not a high GPA person. I used to hate the exams in IIT. I used to burn midnight oil till 3 a.m. And then I used to dread the operations research and all the complex math. Why the hell am I going through all this stuff? The exam that I took to get into IIT, the calculus stuff, the trigonometry stuff, seemed so theoretical. Did not seem to make logical sense. And the only reason you burned midnight oil was so that you could just get some reasonable grades. But, and then if I, if I go back in time, I remember, like I'm from IIT Madras, the only redemption when I was going through this pain was going to ceremony to have special chai at 3 a.m. You literally look forward to that and everything else was torture. Now, if you go back in time, if you think about we solved all this, if you think about any journey of an IITM, maybe like now it starts like in ninth grade or eighth grade or whenever, you solve all these complex math algos. I went through this. And then in the real world, what do you do? The best math you can do, the most complex math you do is a spreadsheet to use four functions, plus, minus, multiplication, and division. But that is changing now. That is because of the, the explosion of the data and the need for the advanced computational algorithms to disrupt industries. I didn't realize that for the first 15 minute years of my career. I only realized that in the last five years. So I'm not like, thank you for what I went through and the pain I went through, because now some of those memory recalls are happening and our ability as leaders or founders or entrepreneurs or new guys from the college and how can you bring the dna the wiring that you have of the computational logic that you did but never applied to bring to market in different forms and the geeks time to peak i'm going to end with a call to action this is a very action-oriented company um, we want to see how we can help through a network. Of course, mutual, right? So we created this email. Please write this down. India AI 100 at highradius.com. We have a lot of IITMs at High Radius. Of course, we have a lot of non-IITMs. They're all same, right? It's just a degree and a, and a logo as they did. And then just send us an email. It could be anything. It could be startup advice, connecting to VCs or career guidance. So it could be anything. It's just the passion that we have to make an impact, right? 
the only common theme here of course is we cannot help you if you either in a completely different industry but maybe we can connect you to someone we know so please write down this email id it's a group account uh, we will probably connect to one of these six people and we have also a lot of other people based on your need and then of course it can be mutual so with that i'm going to close with it's the geeks time to speak and take questions and i hope i was less than 18 minutes All right, I'll take the first question. Where do you see more potential for data and AI? Is it in the B2B space or B2C space? Honestly, I'm not from B2C, so I'm not qualified to answer. Uh, big picture, I think any category, any industry that you believe you can accumulate a lot of data because the business transactions that get conducted in that ecosystem, and then you again authentically believe, I mean, AI can have a lot of hype. So beyond hype, you can bring the computational algorithms to fundamentally change the experience of customers. So on the B two B side, we think every software category will be rewritten over the next decade, and we think it will be called autonomous software. Of course, that's a term we coined. But if I think about like Salesforce as a system, it's actually one of the dumbest software that I respect a lot. Salesforce has only like three objects: account object, contact object, and opportunity object. And basic CRUD functionality: create, read, update, delete. I'm sure somebody will disrupt it because I think when you create an opportunity in Salesforce and put a close date, it should tell you that it's not feasible based on the history of data. And there is zero intelligence in a CRM system, so that's a potential category. I mean, you can literally take any category in B2B software, of course, and you, uh, you can you can rewrite it in a different way to completely disrupt it. Of course, it will take a decade, as we said, if you have to build a category. Lead, Leader, uh, leader that you have to have the patience in the long game. Okay, I'm going to take the next question. Would SaaS companies like Hyradius be interested in working with folks with engineering background who are no longer in core software engineering and tech domains? The answer is yes. It's not just about Hyradius. I encourage all the other companies in India to do the same because I do think that talent. Uh, Means first, it starts with the brain power, and then skills can be taught. It's the attitude first, and the talent first, and then the skills can be taught. So we 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 are a bit maverick mavericky on how we hire, but absolutely, I, I just gave you the example of one of our employees. So I don't think it matters if you have an engineering background or any background because whatever you study, kind of you don't apply in the real world. So if you have the the grit and the and the drive to pick up, then why not? The next question here, and feel free to start pinging your questions on the chat window. We'll wrap up in eight minutes or before. We're already 22 minutes in. How easy is it for experienced talent that is outside India? How can they work with the younger workforce in India? Did you face any cultural issues when you moved back? Huge cultural issues when I moved back. It took me six months to figure out that I need to start doing tie breaks, and the real business discussion happens offline, not in a conference room. And then it was a big adjustment for me, but I worked hard to make that adjustment. So one of the most common advices I give to the the, the leaders who are probably grew up in India, worked in India, and then moved to the U.S. is try to figure out a way like East meets West. How do you get the best of both worlds together? You cannot change a whole system. You can change yourself, but there are things that you have learned as unique experiences that you can bring if the other side sees value in it for them selfishly again. So yeah, but it was it was it, it took me um, it was a lot of challenges. I mean, there's some of the positive changes that I was able to bring was when I first uh, moved to India in 2012. Uh, I saw that uh, all the managers used to have conference uh, meeting rooms. Uh, the team leads used to have the corner space in the workstation, so I killed that. I waited for six months, of course, because I didn't want to be too rude. But then I immediately killed it, and I made it a lottery system. So we got rid of every office except for maybe the MD or the CFO for confidentiality reasons, and everybody else on the floor. And then no special, uh, what I call as the the hierarchical system that we are in India, right? Whether it's the caste system or whatsoever equivalent. 
We had no special treatment. Everybody gets a workstation. So we had a bidding system. You could bid. The bid was within a team. Like you'll take everybody out for lunch and somebody would outbid them by saying, I'll take everybody out for dinner. Then you can choose the seat. If it is not a bidding system, then it's a random system. It's a lottery system. So those are some of the positive changes I was able to bring. But then I, I learned a lot about the workforce in terms of it's a very socially intertwined workforce. Uh, personal and work lives are intertwined. Uh, I think in the U.S. and other countries, it's like work is work and personal is personal. So those are some of the tough adjustments that I had to go through to try my best to blend in. Next question is, how does AI disrupt traditionally core financial divisions like investment banking for capital raising? Interesting. Thinking. Recording in progress. I mean... I don't have an answer, but let's kind of apply first principles to this problem. What is the role of an investment banker? I mean, basically they're a broker to connect an entrepreneur to an investor. So that's the as is state and the investment banker has credibility and they have network and they have contacts. The entrepreneur does not. <laughs> nobody knows them and nobody trusts them and they think they're not going anywhere. So how do you, so the investment banker brings that credibility to connect A to B, that's one. The second thing that the investment banker does is bring some polishness to your pitch, which I was pretty off in most of my presentations and I still am. But I think those, I mean, I think, I think about first principles is take an industry, break it down to the crux of what they deliver in a simple way, introductions, connections, credibility, um, and then polishing the deck presentation. And now if you're an entrepreneur and you want to, you feel like you're going to disrupt an investment banking industry, which I think you should, because they charge a lot of money, almost like five to eight percent of the fundraise, which is ridiculous. Uh, the entrepreneur should take the money to invest in the business. That's how you should think about. It. Now, is it AI to disrupt that? I don't know about that. So first, don't get too carried away by AI because hype won't help you build a business. So don't try to take AI and every problem looks like a nail and then you'll, uh, and AI is the hammer. Uh, first principles, think about the industry you're evaluating, the category that you are evaluating, how is it being served? What is the as is? And can you come up with a future state of to be that you have a strong conviction makes logical sense. All right, we have three more minutes. So I'm gonna take probably one or two questions before we close. Do you think there is a brand perception problem that is keeping India from becoming a big software exporter? How do we shed the IT services and outsourcing tag? Yeah, there is always a brand perception problem based on the past to present history till somebody changes it. And I don't think it has anything to do with the IT services. I think we live in a fairly capitalistic free markets world. And uh, branding is important, don't get me wrong, but I think the opportunity we are talking about is if you have a highly differentiated product, I think it will speak for itself. So if you take Hydris' own struggles as an example, for the first seven years, we did struggle. We got tagged as our competitor would use the famous fear, uncertainty, doubt technique. It's a famous technique. I hate this technique. We don't use it at Hydris, but the competitor would just literally pour like blood on you where they would basically say, oh, you're dealing with a company and your ticket will go to India, you won't understand them and uh, and so forth kind of stuff. Okay, but it was hard to compete because it looked an apples to apples product. So, so I do think that you can overcome that if you genuinely build an original product that is highly differentiated. But if you build the same product, then you have the default unfair advantage of the brand perception, the legacy brand perception. All right, last question so that I'm respectful of all of your time. The sip, all right, let's see. The difference of sales guys and most techies is that sales guys create brands like Nike, how techies like Sundar, Satya, and Arvind are working as employees of big brands. Your thoughts on this, very good question. So I think it's the glass ceiling problem, right? I mean, the glass ceiling problem could be various things we have in the in the society, right? It could be based on, I'm sure it's there in India too, so don't complain about this, right? There is a huge gender bias in India, as an example, there is glass ceiling, there is a North India, South India bias, 
there is a skin color bias and so forth. So let's not complain about some other market. Uh, let's think about our own industry. So I think what you're seeing though is the glass ceiling is being broken, both from a regular corporate ladder standpoint and A, and B, also from an entrepreneurship standpoint. If you look at the number of companies that are getting funded in, from India as we speak, they don't have the brand perception issue. I mean, Tiger Global is an investment in India. I just talked to John Curtis, who is a partner who invested in software earlier today. He's super bullish on India. I don't think he has any issues in terms of any perception. So, yeah, I think the, 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 the the, the ground reality has changed, and that's why I call it the, it's the geek's time to peak. So I would not overthink that. All right. It's on the dot. So thank you so much for having me. Arka, back to you. Thank you, Sashi. That was a very interesting session, and uh, you know, great insights coming out. Um, not geeks time to peak and uh, you know how how india is no less uh, than any other developed countries in terms of brand position so they, those were great thoughts thank you so much for joining us all right thank you